Hello and welcome back to a new player series for Crusader Kings 2. So last time we set up our council and the previous time we set up ourselves. So now we're going to start talking about something else. We're going to talk about our laws. We're going to talk specifically about succession law and a question that we had. So somebody asked um, straightforwardly, how do you become primogenitor? How do you switch your succession law to primogenitor? So before we get into that, we're going to talk about what succession law is and uh, what the different types are. So, first of all, our succession law right now is agnatic, cognatic, gavel kind. What does this mean? Well, we talked about this previously, but we'll quickly go over it. Agnatic, cognatic. Agnatic means males inherit. Cognatic means females inherit, roughly, at least in game terms. I'm sure they have better meanings in, I think, Latin. Um, and then gavel kind means that um, basically first, uh, first heir gets first dibs on things, second heir gets second dibs, that sort of thing. So it's, uh, and then it splits out evenly-ish between them. So, um, what can we change things to? Well, we can change things to agnatic right now, because, um, well, we haven't looked a lot about this, if we hover over the question mark, it just tells you how to do things in the game. We have not previously changed the succession law, we have reigned for 10 years, we are at peace, we have no regency, the title is not on vice royalty, no vassals are fighting each other, and everybody at least has a positive opinion of you. No vassals have a negative opinion. I believe the reason it says no vassal has a negative opinion is because if they have zero opinion, that's not positive opinion, but it's not negative. So that's why it says it like that. So we could switch it to agnatic. So that means only males could inherit. Now, why would that be good? Well, generally, uh, what will happen with marriages in the game were, would be if a male marries a female, the male dynasty will go down. Like that, that, that will be the one that the children will have unless it's a matrilineal marriage. So when you have it so that both males and females can inherit, the female inherits, what happens is it goes to the next, the next person in line is the next person down, and then they're not of your dynasty and you lose the game. Next, uh, so that's not generally that great, but it's fine to have agnatic cognatic right now, and if we're worried about it, we just marry people off matrilineally, or we make them take the vows. So that's something that we have the option to do. Next one is absolute cognatic. So what this one is, is men in, uh, is women inherit on the same grounds that men do. So right now with agnatic cognatic, what happens is it's men inherit, then women inherit. So what this one will do is this will be, um, actually no, it's men and women inherit, it's just when they were born. So this one is involves a little bit more work. So if we hover over this, what does it require? Well, it requires all the same stuff for changing a succession law, but it also requires that one of these must be true. So, we must either be a culture that, like, um, ourselves must be a culture that accepts this. So it must be Basque, Cathar, or uh, Mesolian. Uh, so any of those, if we're any of those, we can make that happen. Or we must have the law, which is full status of women. So there's a law in here which is like um, status of women, and it's basically what they're allowed to do. Or we have the game rule set at the start, which is gender equality is on. Now I just have the base set up, so I didn't change anything apart from disabling uh, one DLC, uh, which is Sunset Invasion, which basically adds in a bit of alt history, which I didn't really want for this series. So I don't have that on currently. So that's why this is set up like it is. Now. Succession laws. We have elective Gavelkind. Now this is very similar to Gavelkind. So Gavelkind right now is the first son inherits, uh, then it's like, you know, second son, third son, whatever. It's that kind of setup. Elective Gavelkind is the order is voted on, basically. So whoever has the most votes will take the most stuff. Whoever has the second most votes will take the second most stuff. And I believe this is between all your vassals. Let's have a look here. Um, no, it's from the ruling dynasty. So what this is is basically um, everybody in the root, uh, every one of your vassals, I think, can vote for uh, someone of your dynasty to um, get the next title, and then it'll hand it off to heirs and things like. That. It'll hand it off to each heir as it goes along. So it's kind of cool, but not really what we're looking for. Um, if we're switching from gavel kind, we really want to switch to something that's a little bit more stable for the realm. That's the reason we'd switch. 
Next one is seniority. Now, this is the oldest member of the dynasty inherits all the titles. So your oldest child will disapprove when you put this through, but everyone else will like it. Because generally what that means is the oldest person will have the best stats, generally, like 90% of the time, because they've lived longer. They'll probably, um, like, they'll, they'll just be a, a better person in general to be in charge. Now, here's the negative with it. If the oldest person is always inheriting, you're always getting a new person in charge. You're always getting a, sh a penalty for them being like a new ruler. Um, because basically, you'll get the oldest person, say you have a 60 year old, they die. Next person in charge is another 60 year old. He dies, you get another 60 year old. He dies, and you can see the problem. So you're gonna constantly have eld like uh, the oldest person dying. Now, why is this good? Why is this succession law really good? Well, not only do you have generally okay stats or good stats, generally they'll have a few friends and things. They'll have connections, which is good. Um, and it also says very specifically, the oldest member of the dynasty inherits all titles. So of the dynasty, you're unlikely to get a game over with seniority because unless you lose every single member of your family. So this is really good if you're unsure about um, like how to play the game, like or if you're unsure about getting succession just right. Seniority is something you can just stick on, and the next person who inherits will always be somebody um, who you can continue playing with, generally. Well, unless you lose your realm, in which case that's another problem. Next one is Primogenitor, which is basically the oldest child of the ruler inherits all the titles. So this is um, what you would most typically see in uh, some sort of, sh like in a Game of Thrones style situation, this is probably what you'd see. So uh, spoilers for Game of Thrones Season 1, when Ned Stark dies, his son Rob gets all of his titles. He gets the, the County of, of uh, Winterhold, is it Winterhold? Um, I might be confusing it with Skyrim there, but yes, he gets the main uh, he gets the main um, castle that they have. He then also gets the Kingdom of the North. Like Those are things that are handed down to him because he is the oldest son. That is how Primogenitor works. And that's generally what most people expect as they're going into succession laws and stuff in this type of game. Elective Monarchy. So this is similar to Elective Cavalcade, except that it's the person who ele who's elected gets everything. Now... It's not a game over if somebody else gets voted in here. So this is actually not only people of your dynasty. This is anybody can get voted in here. So, um, elective monarchy will basically be amongst your vassals. Everybody gets a little vote. And they'll say, I actually, I would quite like, like this person to be in charge. So generally, it means that the realm, like the uh, realm that you're playing in. So say in the Holy Roman Empire, I think they have elective monarchy. Uh, let me just double check here. Yes, they have elective monarchy. They have agnatic elective, so only males, and it's elective. So what this means is anybody in the Holy Roman Empire can be voted in charge of the Holy Roman Empire. When they, when the current emperor dies, the next person will take the empire. He will take the capital duchy. So wherever the capital is, he'll take that duchy, and he'll take the capital. Um, and that, and everything else goes with the person who has it. So right now. The guy who has it, he will loot his um, proper heir for everything else. Will take uh, like his heir for elective. Will take the Holy Roman Empire. They will probably take the Duchy of Franconia, and maybe everything in the Duchy of Franconia that isn't. So they'll take everything that's in the Duchy of Franconia. I believe that's how it works now, because uh, they did change it this patch. But this guy, he may get to keep say the County of uh, Bamberg because it's not in the Duchy of Franconia. Um, so he'll still be, you'll still be playing the game. You'll still be in charge of something, but someone else is in charge of the empire for that point. But then if the next emperor dies, you might be voted in and then you get all the stuff back. So elective's a little bit weird. We're probably not gonna do anything with it right now, but I like elective. Elective is also pos uh, popular with your vassals. So basically, um, what this will do is your vassals will like it because they have a chance of getting power. But if you hold too many of the titles that have votes associated with them, so say you hold um, a ton of different duchies around the place, 
um, your vassals aren't going to be happy because if they held that title, they could, uh, they would have a vote or like um, things like that, or um, your vote wouldn't matter as much. So that's basically why elective. The elective has a lot of positives, but most people don't like playing with it. And then we have Ultima Genitor, which is very interesting, um, but isn't really used a lot. Ultima Genitor is the youngest um, child inheritance. So, why is this interesting? Why is this not just awful? Well, it's interesting because with seniority, the problem was the oldest person inherits and they die quickly. So they get a short reign penalty. With the ultimate janitor, generally the youngest person inherits, so they're not that good when they start, but they're gonna probably live a long time if they survive, like through their childhood. So what this means is that you're gonna have a long reign penalty. So people are actually gonna like it because you're in charge for a very long time. So Ultimate Janitor has some really good positives here. Um, so I quite like this one. Right, now we have had a look at all the different succession laws. Let's have a look at how to actually get Primogenitor done, because that was what the question was. So, have not previously changed the succession law. We've done that, we haven't previously done this. Have reigned for 10 years. Our character has reigned for 10 years. That's good. Is at peace. We are at peace. No regency. We have nobody... We have no regency, we're not infirm or anything like that, so that's good. Title is not a vice royalty, so it's not a vice royalty, so it doesn't apply to us, so that's good. No vassals are fighting each other, okay. No vassal has a negative opinion of you, we have that, so that's good. Right, next one. Um, The holder, if any held title is a vice royalty, we could change it to primogenitor. Now... Um, this doesn't, this, now you see up above it says title is not vice royalty. So, what this means is say we were given a kingdom to look after as a vice royalty. If we had a duchy underneath it and we held the vice royalty, we could change that duchy to be primogenitor because we hold the vice royalty as, as our title. We could not change the vice royalty's succession to primogenitor. Kind of odd, but that's just what that means. Next one is if all of the following must be true. We have to have conclave enabled because this is a conclave option. But if we have late feudal administration or imperial administration, we can switch our title to primogenitor. If we don't have conclave enabled, that option is not available to us. So basically, if we change our law to allow this, then that's something that we can do. Next one is the kingdom of France must have high crown authority or absolute crown authority. Currently, it does not. Now, we could go and try and convince our king to switch things towards that. But, um, assuming that we can't, that option's out for us as well. Next one is Holder, which is us, uh, must have all of the following not be true. We are not... We do, we do not have full council authority as a law, currently. And we do not have the law elective monarch. So, right now, we have all the conditions bar that one of the following must be true. So, as uh, we we're going through it, we can either try and change the Kingdom of France's law to, to High Crown Authority or Absolute Crown Authority, or we can change our law to have Late Fuel Administration or Imperial Administration, and that would work. So, let's have a look at our Realm Laws. So, we have a whole bunch of laws. So, first of all, Crown Laws in the Kingdom of France apply to the Duchy of Burgundy. So, basically, if we have a look up here, all these little Crown Laws, they all apply to us. So... Investiture is free, so we can appoint bishops as we feel, rather than the Pope uh, appointing them. Controlled realm inheritance, so that's free currently. So if it's illegal, that means that titles cannot pass outside the realm through inheritance. So if somebody dies and their heir is in the Holy Roman Empire, that person is skipped in the line of inheritance. And free means it can just pass wherever it wants. Next one is vassal war declaration, so that is allowed. So currently, all vassals are allowed to declare wars wherever they like. Next one is vassals are forbidden from declaring wars on enemies within the realm, but may attack external enemies. So that's pretty good if you're in charge. You may want your vassals not have infighting, but to instead focus on everything else or illegal. Your vassals will not fight at all. So vassals don't like that because they can't do anything with it, basically. So those laws apply to us right now. So vassals are allowed to declare war. A inheritance can pass outside the realm and we're allowed to appoint bishops. Right. So, centralization. 
this one is basically how many vassals we can hold. So if we uh, make our centralization higher here, so we're at minimum centralization. If we go to low, this one means that we can hold more land ourselves. So we're becoming more centralized in our power, but we can hold less vassals underneath us. So basically we can control less people, but we're managing our own, but we can manage more ourselves. So uh, that's something we might want to change, but we're not going to do that. Status of women is the next one we're talking about. If it goes up to full, that's when you can switch it to uh, absolute, absolute cognatic. So um, it's where women are considered to be equals of men in this society. Now, just as a point, this is a, this game was based is kind of based in medieval times, so obviously that's why it started off all the way down here. So it's not like any kind of uh, any kind of social issue here. It's just how it was in medieval times. Right. Next one is revoke title. So this is we can either say nobody's right. We're not allowed to revoke titles. We can make it allowed, which basically means we can revoke titles from people. So we can we can take titles from our vassals. And the final one is we are allowed to revoke titles uh, from religious people like from infidels, from her from people who are not our religion. Uh, I was going to say heretics, but that's a different thing in-game. Uh, but So infidel, somebody who is not part of a religious group, we can just take their stuff without caring. So that's what that one is. And then administration. So right now we're in feudal administration. So this is just kind of basic kind of uh, everybody just owes fealty to those directly above. Kind of just basic stuff. Nothing special about it. Doesn't do anything. Late feudal administration. Now, this one allows different succession laws, like primogenitor, and vassals who refuse liege interference in wars are seen as traitors. So, say two of our vassals were fighting each other, and we want to say, no, stop fighting, stop doing that. Um, vassals who refuse, they were seen as traitors, and then imperial is something for. Uh, I think this one's mostly used by uh, the Byzantines, I think, are on Imperial. Is there a way of checking that? I don't know if you can check laws from other realms. I don't think you can. Uh, no, it's not very easy to check laws from other realms if you can do it. Anyway, uh, I think the Byzantines start off with Imperial stuff. So, um, basically, it's that kind of similar to of the Roman Empire, it says. So, it allows more succession laws. Vassals refuse. So those are from the previous one. They're from late. They can implement duchy vice royalties, and they can revoke uh, vice royalty duchy titles for free. So they can give out duchies for people to look after, but they can also take them back for free. Right. So we want to switch to late feudal administration if we want to switch to primogenitor. So let's just say we do. Let's let's do that. The supporters are Mayor Guy of Simur, and then we have four people who are against it. Count Hughes. Uh, when is that Benoit? Um, I, I hate French names because I have no idea how to pronounce them, but uh, hopefully this is fine. Uh, Guillaume, maybe for the next one, and then Jack. Um, so th those four people are voting against it. And if we have a look at our council here, we'll see that we have all of these people here. So Mayor Guy, he's into it. He has 79 opinion of us. He really likes us. He's going to vote with us. The rest aren't, aren't so sure. So what we want to do here is we want to go to the My Council tab. We can see why they're voting this, the way they're voting. So, this guy, uh, Mayor Guy, is in fact a loyalist. So he likes us. He will vote with us no matter what. He will do whatever we say. He is a yes man, and we like him for that. Next one is a zealot. So basically, he's very much about religious wars and religious things and things against heathens, and he doesn't care about anything else. So he's going to be difficult to move over. Uh, from an ideological standpoint, there's nothing we can really do there. But that's what he's there, therefore. And then a pragmatist. They are inclined to support wars for reclaiming de jure land. Um, they also will support wars against weak opponents. So they're very much like, uh, they will take the sensible option. They will oppose the creation of strong vassals in the realm and will support revoking of titles from already powerful vassals. So they want everybody to kind of be equal within the realm, but equally weak. They're kind of, you know... They're very much the straightforward, logical thinkers. And that's what the last three are. Now, why do they want to vote against um, Imperial Administration late? Well, basically, it's because it goes against their interests. So if we go back here, um, most of these people, like these three people, are landed. And it goes against their interests to vote for this because 
well, you know, um, we can interfere in their law, in their wars now, and they could be seen as traitors. They don't like that. They also just naturally don't have a reason to vote for it. Like, they're just like, okay, why, why would I vote for this? What, what benefit does it bring me? I'm just gonna, no, I don't want to change it. I don't want to give you more power for no reason. So, let's have a look at what our options are for convincing them. So we pretty much have, like, a couple of options. First one is, we make them like us more. If they like us more, they might just vote for it, because they like us a lot. Their, their opinion of us may outweigh their negative thoughts towards this. But that's probably not going to happen. They are pragmatists, um, so they probably just don't want us to vote. Uh, they don't want us to get extra powers over them. They don't want us to become more powerful. So what are we going to do? Well, we could buy favors from them. You could either request their council support, in which case we would owe them a favor, and favors are things where they can call in for, they make us vote on different laws, they can make us uh, accept marriage proposals, things like that. Um, so we could do that, we could say, if you vote with us, we will give you a favor. We will allow you to press your agenda specifically, and then they'll vote with us for 36 months. Or, we can try and buy a favor. Now we don't actually have enough money to buy a favor from the first guy, but if we get a favor from him, we can then say, okay, we're going to call in our favor to make you vote with us. So that's what um, that one's for. So is there somebody we can actually buy a favor from? I don't think we have enough money to buy a favor currently. We do not have enough money to buy a favor. So what we're going to do is we are going to very, we are going to basically um, request council support. So let's find the people we want to request council support from. So um, I'm trying to work out what they might want to do. So maybe if we request council support from a bishop, uh, not from, it, from the zealous person, he may try and get us to vote towards something zealous. Maybe does he have any children who are unmarried? Um, he has a few children who are unmarried. He may force us into a marriage here. So that might be what he does. Um, so I think that what we're going to do is we are going to give him a favor. We're going to give him a favor. We don't really care about our children being married to one of his ones. It doesn't seem like a problem for us. We'll, we'll do that. We'll request his support. We'll see if he accepts it. Um, next one, um, this guy, he does not have any children. Uh, he may try and get a marriage for himself. Uh, that's not, I'm not necessarily against that either. That might probably be what he uses his favor for. Or they'll use, the, use it to make us vote for something else. So that's not too bad. And now we can see why they might do it or why they might not do it. So they would only accept uh, this thing. They would only accept us giving them a favor for their support if they like us. And then they have a base reluctance, which that basically means that's their I don't really want to do it kind of reluctance thing. But because they like us a lot, they're, they're willing to do this. So we'll get that guy to vote with us. So if they come back and say yes, that means we'll have Guy, we'll have uh, Gula May, and we'll have Hughes voting with us. So that means that gives us three people, plus ourselves, so that's four votes against two. Now, if we had only got Guy and uh, Gula May to vote with us, that'd be three versus three. I'm not sure if that's a pass for a lot. I don't think it is, but um, four against two is definitely a pass, so I just want to be safe there. Right. So that's that law. That's that law going through once we uh, get the favors in. So we'll need to wait for the favors to actually go in. Which means we have to unpause the game. Uh, next one in the laws thing is obligations. This is basically very simple. Uh, there's the four different types of vassals: your nobles, those people with castles; your burghers, those are the people with uh, cities. Your like so they'll be like mayors and things. Uh, next one is your church vassals. So they're anybody religious. And then your next one is tribal vassals. They're all the tribal people who don't have proper castles. So, and then you can basically go between tax and levy. So you can either provide you more troops or more tax. It starts off right in the middle. And then the further you go along one way, they give you more of that thing. So uh, at the start, they give us 20% tax uh, for tribals. On this one, they give us 20 minimum levy. So that means at minimum, they have to give us 20 levy. But the amount they have to give maximum is down by 60. So they will only give us um, a max of 40% of their levy. Um, but they have to give us at least 20. If we go up to the top here, by minimum, they have to give us 60% of their levy. But they give us no money. But their max levy is down by 20% here. So they can give us, they have to give us 60, but they can give us 80 if they like us. So, um, you know, it's quite a major percentage swing. 
Uh, so that's pretty good. And then the last one is Council Laws. So this is what the Council basically does. So right now, Council is empowered. So this means that they can do a whole bunch of different things. And if we go back to Abolish Council, this one means that only laws, law changes, cannot be voted on by the Council. It disables the use of Realm Peace. As uh, so Realm Peace is basically if you want your vassals to stop fighting each other. Or fighting other people. And it also disables the advisor minor titles for kings and emperors. Increases the amount of land you can hold yourself. And it means that you can vote on laws just by yourself. So this is actually reasonably good for a ruler to have. Like, this is kind of the ideal if you're in charge. Is to have this one. Now, your vassals will obviously want to have more power. That your council members specifically will want to have more power. So they want to get as many of these laws passed as possible. Next one is war declaration. This basically means council members vote on, law, uh, on war. Now, what's interesting is if you change it to other things, um, it, if it's only ruler in charge, council members can join factions freely if it's on here. Um, for I think that's for just this, or can I hover over the other ones here? Uh, no, so if this one is set to ruler, council members can just join factions as, as they want because they have no power. Um, and war declarations cannot be voted on by the council with this way. This this one, war declarations voted on by the council, but you get a bonus. You get extra vassals you can hold, because your vassals are happier. Revoke titles, councils can vote on, on uh, revoking whether you can revoke a title or not. More vassals can be held. Imprisonment, if it's just ruler, that means only we can vote on it. Uh, like only, well not vote, we can just imprison whoever we like. Otherwise, council votes. Banishment, council votes. It's all fairly straightforward. Grand titles, council would vote on it. Execution, council would vote on it. And this basically just increases the amount of vassals we can hold with each one of these laws. Like, each one that passes gives us an extra two vassals. So, fairly straightforward stuff there. Right, we're going to rattle through some more of these tabs, and then we might unpause the game before the end of this episode. Technology. Technology we've already kind of talked about. Basically, each one of these things gives you some sort of stat boost or something. I'll say it on each of these ones if you hover over. I'll give you stat boosts, give you stat boosts. The only ones really worth caring about are the ones where, say, if you hover over here, it says unlocked. So this one unlocks extra buildings for us to build. So generally, it'll say, like, on our province here, uh, if we're going to build buildings, it'll say, when we hover over the little, little cogs, it'll say, no, nope, you can't build that building. You have to have improved keeps at least level 4. So we'd go into our tech, we'd go, okay, improved keeps has to be level 4. And that will unlock all the buildings. So when we have enough economic tech, we can click this button. So we have to have 438 economic tech. We can click that, I'll unlock the improved keeps. And then we can build that building if we wanted to. Another one important to look at is legalism. This one, basically, if we hover over, like, level 4 doesn't do anything for us, but over level 5, it basically unlocks more options in terms of law. So it makes, it gives you more law options. So that's important to note. And Majesty, uh, the more of this you get, the lower your short reign penalty is. So that would make Ultima Genitor better, because you'd be able to, um, like, your new person who's in charge won't get a penalty because they've just come in charge. So that's useful or they'll get a lower penalty or a shorter penalty. So I think this is a useful one to know about as well. Military organization is also reasonably useful because it gives you increased retinue size so you can have a larger standing army. And if we move along, you'll see it says removes the pagan homeland attrition bo uh, penalty. So basically, uh, pagans by default get let, have some have defense of pagans where basically if you're not a pagan and you're attacking their lands, you will take massive attrition. So you'll just get a massive amount of men just naturally dying, walking through their lands. So if you get up to military organization at least level 4, it removes the attrition penalty. Useful to uh, know about. Next tab is military. This shows how strong we are. Uh, from uh, from domain, this is basically our... Um, this is how much we have in our lands that we directly control. And then the next one is from vassals. So that's how, that's raising the vassal troops, and that's hired. So the hired's like mercenaries or holy war orders or things like that. And then it's how much they cost us. Fleet levies, same for boats. We don't have any boats because we have no like sea near us. We, we're completely landlocked. And then retinue tab is something which is added in the Legacy of Rome DLC. So if you don't have that, you won't have this tab, I don't think. I think it uh, this becomes a different tab at that point. I'm not 100% sure because I haven't played with, without it for a while. 
But basically what this one will do is this one uh, allows you to buy standing armies and then you pay you pay to reinforce them. Uh, then we have our Intrigue tab, which we're going to very quickly skip over because yeah, we're coming back to it. Faction tab. If someone's rising up against you, if somebody wants something to pass, this is where it'll pop up. And you can also join factions within the kingdom that you're in. We actually can't do it anymore because we are in a council and the council gets to vote on war declarations. So we cannot join a faction unless our council is discontent. So that's what that meant previously when we were looking at war declarations. I actually didn't know that. That's interesting uh, to know, but that's cool. So you find out something new each time you hover over one of these tooltips. Um, religion. This is very specifically for Catholics right now. This particular tab is different for each religion. But for Catholics, uh, we have a Pope. If we click on this, this can look a little bit overwhelming. This is basically um, the vote for the next Pope. So we'll see, we have the Pope, we have the Preferatus, who is the likely person to be the next Pope based upon all of the Cardinals. So basically there's a College of Cardinals, each person gets to vote. Um, right now it says, if the Pope died right now, I would vote for this person. That person becomes Preferatus. Pope dies, this person comes in charge. You can spend money to make more people, uh, to basically uh, make there be a better chance of your uh, Cardinal going on to the Council of Cardinal, College of Cardinals, sorry. And then the more people you control in the College of Cardinals, the more chance you have of getting your person to be in charge of the Preferatus. If, your pre if the Pope dies, the Preferatus comes in charge, you put him in charge, he likes you a lot. He's somebody you put there. He's gonna let you do stuff. So that's what um, that's what this basically is. And then it shows you the expected next cardinal. So if a cardinal dies, a new cardinal go up. If you get this number to be higher than their number, then th that'll put them in charge. We're not gonna look at that right now. Not important, but useful to know. And then we get vassal bi vassal bishops. So if we wanted to appoint somebody as the next bishop, we could just designate it. So we could just say this person is going to be the person, next person in charge of this land when the current guy dies. And that's basically by, that's because we have free investiture instead of papal investiture. If the Pope, if we had papal investiture, the Pope would just decide who's next in charge. If we don't do anything, I believe that this guy becomes the next in charge. Yeah, Jasper. Um, and yeah, and this is the cardinal appointment score that we looked at in here. So there we go. Uh, that's all we need to look at in there. And then we have the new tab for societies. Now, this one is just added in amongst the mystics. So this is really cool and kind of new stuff to me. But basically, each society, if we list all of the ones that we know, they all have a thing. They have um, a barri barrier to entry. So they have some sort of thing that you need to do. So if we hover over the Benedictine Order's little join society button, you must be 16, you must be a Catholic, you must not be a heretic, and um, you must have like a okay. Let's let's go through this again. You must be sixteen. Uh, one of the following must be true: you are either a Catholic or you are not a heretic, and you are one of the following religions. So you have to be Fraticelli, uh, a uh, Waldens, a uh, Waldensian. Oh, sorry, a uh, Lollard or Cathar. So basically, how that would happen, all of those ones listed below are heretics to start with, like heretical religions. But if the Fraticelli faith gets strong enough, it no longer is a heretic religion, at which point that would flip over and you could then join the society. You have to not be excommunicated, you did not betray society, I'm not entirely sure what that means, uh, and you have to have a personal wealth, so presumably there's a joining fee. And then for the rest of them, they all have their own stuff. So like this one's a little bit less bothersome. This one's the Dominican order. Basically this one is like, okay, you, if you're in a non-heretical faith, then you can join. This one's like, no, you're, if you're a Catholic, you can join. If you're not Catholic, we don't want to hear about you. Then you get the Hermetic Society. So this one, this one actually doesn't care what religion you are. Basically, well, it cares what religion you are. It just doesn't care um, if you're a Catholic or not. It's just, are you Christian, Muslim, Israelite, Mazadan, Zunist, or you have the religion Hellenic? All of those are okay. And none of the following can be true. So you can't be a tribal, and you can't be nomadic, and you have to be older than 16. And then Lucifer's own is like, it's a, it's a more sinister society. It's a devil worshippers thing. And this one, you have to be a sinner. So we'll talk about that in a second, because you might be thinking, our character is a sinner. 
but we'll talk about that just one second and then you have to be part of one of these religions so christian muslim mazdan israelite zunist or church of zun so you might be thinking sinner we're a kinslayer that's a pretty big sin as sins go it does not mean that now i'm gonna have to click around characters till i find one. Oh, i found one cool this one is red and if we hover over it says the fifth deadly sin is wrath so this is what it means by sinner it means you have one of the sins as your trait i believe that's what it means anyway so that's why we can't currently uh and this one because it's a little bit more sinister we don't just join we don't just say ah we're gonna pay the joining fee we're gonna join up we're gonna sign up to this one this one's like no we have to just show interest and maybe we'll be contacted by them so are there any of these orders we want to join um i don't know I think we should join one. Let's just join the Benedictine Order. Not entirely sure what we're going to be able to do here. But we'll join in at level 1. We'll see what our society's like. God's blessing upon thee, Duke Robert. We're delighted by your decision to join our ranks as a lay member and Duke. Uh, together we shall strive for the betterment of ourselves and our fellow Catholics by following the rule of Saint Benedict. And go with God, signed Conversus uh, Aldebert. So it is a great honor. We pay our 12 gold. We are now a member of the society. We're at the lowest level. We're a Dauntus. So, then we can see we have a devotion score. Which basically allows us, the more devotion it allows us to then spend that on other things. So if we were, say, up to the next level of Oblatus, we could use the power to take a vow of celibacy. So that means we could be celibate if we wanted to. Which is useful in some ways, but not so much. We can also spend devotion to basically level up. And we have to have spent a couple of years as the previous one. It also gives us this neat little haircut, which looks god-awful. So that is obviously the biggest uh, benefit of this one. Right. Now we're going to go to the Intrigue tab, and we're going to talk through this one. So, this one is all your decisions. This is the top part. Decisions are basically things that you can just kind of do. That whispering is a little bit loud. I'm going to quickly just uh, knock that down a little bit here. I think that's um ambient sound so let's knock that down on just a little bit sorry about that there we go the whispering is a little bit less now i think so shut the gates this one is well decisions let's talk about them the, the yellow ones are things you probably have to deal with these ones down here things that are less important now this little button next to them is something that was new that was added in um in this patch so basically what I'll do is you can click things and I'll mark them as important or not important. So you see here, if I untick Recruit a Court Physician, which is a, a decision that we can do, we tick it, 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 it goes away. We, um, well, that was, we untick it, it goes away, we tick it, it appears. So what this means is basically if this is something that we can do and it is important, it'll pop up. So say we always want to know when we can hold a feast. We always want to know when, when feasts are around, we just tick it and next time we can hold a feast, it'll pop down useful to know like there are a couple of these ones that maybe um like maybe we do want to just hold a feast every year maybe there's something we want from it we want the opinion bonus from it that's something we can do so right now our only one is recruit court physician so that's something we are actually going to do you've sent messengers and scouts in all directions to scour the realm for skilled physicians that would be willing to take up residence in your court word should reach you shortly if they manage to find a suitable candidate hopefully they will not bring back a Quack Slavler. Quack Slavler? What a weird... I, I've not uh, seen that word before. A Quack Solver? I don't know. Anyway, hope I do not have to wait long. Right. So that's our only decision. It's gone away from up here. If we look at minor titles. We have two that we can grant. Court Physician and Designated Regent. Designated Regent is uh, the only one that we've still got to do because we're currently recruiting a Court Physician from our event there. And then we have a special character action possible. We can ask our liege right now for land for our unlanded son. Which um, he cannot give us right now because he only has he's not going to give away one of his only two counties. But maybe after a war we'll ask him for land and then he may give it away to us. That'd be cool. Right. Well, um, I think, yeah, we'll keep going for just a little bit more. Because I want to be able to just start going uh, with time next episode. So let's go down here. We have... Uh, right here designate regent of burgundy so right now we need to find out who we want to be our regent so let's have a look at opinion so we're going to sort we're going to go to the vassals tab we're going to sort it by opinion we're going to click it twice first of all it puts the highest opinion at the top second click puts highest uh, lowest opinion at the bottom 
So this guy is our vassal, he's our marshal, and he kind of doesn't like us. We're going to hover over why. He doesn't like us because he's envious, because we're bad at diplomacy, and he's cynical and we're zealous. So right now, we are going to click on him. We're going to be like, okay, you are somebody who would be a great candidate for Destination Region. You don't really hate us. Your stewardship isn't that bad. So you're still going to be able to hold the amount of land that we can hold. Although we only actually hold one bit of land right now, so it doesn't matter. Your, reason, your stats are reasonably all right. If you were in charge as the regent, you would not be awful. So we think he's fine. We can... Uh, oh, we can't actually do that right now through this menu. I was going to award him the title through there, but we may have to go through the other menu, which is fine. We go to minor titles, means he designated regent. We're after Hughes right here. And we're going to click on him. And that makes him our designated regent. Although I don't think we can do it right now because he's currently, accept he's currently uh, thinking about another offer of ours. But that's how you basically hand out titles. We want to change our commanders and things at some point. We'll do that before we go to war. And you'll see that we have four other titles we can hand out. Each of these has a salary that we hand out, and a monthly prestige, and a give opinion. So basically what this is, is this is a thing where we can, um, like we can give this out to uh, somebody. They'll like us more, but we have to pay them a little bit of money. It's not a lot of money, but it's a little bit. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.